do the hand signals really quickly. If you agree with something, third finger the hell out of that shit, man. If you disagree with something, go like this. Okay, um, we're gonna kick it off with the poets. They're gonna do a little something for us. And then we're gonna go straight into the speakers. And after the speakers, we will have an open mic and free speech time. And after the free speech, we will head over to the skirmish points on our way to the police station. Yeah! So I'd like you all to give a warm welcome to the poets! or what it's become. It's about the shadows of bodies skirting across concrete and asphalt. It's about all their prayers set through the postmen of earthworms. It's about the footprints behind sprinkler heads under the yellow glow of lampposts. It's about the shuffle of tired feet and their heavy legs under heavy eyes. It's about their repetition-like incantations the careful utterance of an answer in disguise behind a question mark. It's about the presence of police in riot gear. It's about tuition hikes and closed meetings. It's about pepper spray and batons. It's about the students being plucked from the soil of bodies like gossip. Thank you. Thank you.
My name's Goldberry Long. I'm on the faculty at UCR. Where's all my students? Where's all that you can? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I'm not used to megaphones. Hold it right up to your mouth. Hold it up to my mouth like that? Oh my God. Let me tell you about something. I was born to hippie parents. Yeah. I was. My name is Goldberry. So, you know, it's kind of obvious, but I'm going to confess it anyway. And I'll tell you another thing. All those crazy activist hippies really embarrassed me. I didn't like them. I wanted to be normal. I wanted to go with the flow. Even though my name is Goldberry. And I lived in a house with no running water. And I had an outhouse and we were on food stamps. And I just wanted to shut up and get along. It's true. The notion of making a ruckus really bugged me. And I wanted to believe that the system was good. And when they started talking about those bad politicians and the evil government, I would cringe. That was me in my childhood. One of my earliest memories is looking at the TV set, which is going to prove how god-awful old I am, seeing some dude crying. And I said to my mom, oh, that's so sad. Why is he crying? And that was Nixon resigning. <laughs> but I grew up, and I started to teach this class. And the class that I teach is an introduction to creative writing class. And what I teach my students is that they have a right to be heard. Yeah. 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 That they have a right to speak what's on their mind in their own voice. I teach them that and I have to overcome a lot of fear because a lot of them have been taught all their lives to shut up and get along, which I used to think was the right thing to do. And what I see in my students is people who, like me, grew up on welfare, on food stamps, maybe in houses with no running water. Maybe, like me, they got their clothes from the free box and got made fun of for it, which happened to me. Or maybe they grew up in a middle class family, but they happen to be the only kid who's ever gone to, their to a college because their parents barely made it past high school and work three jobs just to support them. Or maybe their mother is a drug addict and their father is who knows where and until recently they were living in a car. Or maybe they only learned to speak English when they were 12 years old. I have all those people in my classes and they are here at this school because they believe that the system was set up to do something good for them which I used to believe too. And I still like to believe when I get in front of my class and I tell my students, make your voice heard. Say what your truth is. And say it loudly and say it in your own voice. So a couple weeks ago, I was on campus and I heard a ruckus. <laughs> and I went to go check out what was going on. And I saw a whole bunch of students right over there speaking in their own voices to the system their truth. Just like I always told them to. Just like I used to be ashamed to do when I was a kid. And just like I was embarrassed about or when my elders did. And what I saw was that the students were speaking their truth and there was a barricade and on the other side of the barricade is what we call their elders or the system that I always thought should be considered good. And they had batons and rifles and guns and helmets and flak jackets to protect themselves from students speaking their truth in their own voices. And they were told, this is an unlawful assembly. This is illegal. 
a liar. Because I stand up in front of my students and I tell them, you have a right to speak your truth. And nobody is allowed to harm you for it or make you stop. And then, as the day progressed, I saw more people in flak jackets with batons and guns standing around, lining the sidewalks while the students danced. <laughs> I saw this with my eyes. I bore witness to this. Mostly I bore witness because I'm still a little timid and because I was listening to them speak their truth. They are the ones who are harmed by this. They are the ones whose tuition goes up every year. They are the ones who are getting priced out of their education. They are the students who come to me in week four of the quarter, week four, begging to get into my classes because they have been waitlisted for every class they need to take and now they're going to get kicked out of school for not being properly fully enrolled and have to pay back their tuition because the university let them in but doesn't have a seat for them. I see this and it's a result of budget cuts and when our students danced in the streets and spoke their truth about what these budget cuts are doing to them and what these tuition increases are doing to them, they were met with men in helmets with batons and rifles and flak jackets. This is the United States of America. You are allowed to speak your truth. You have a constitutional right to speak your truth. Now, I stood there and I bore witness and I saw the soldiers standing on the sidelines with their batons across their chest. Oh, pardon me, did I say soldiers? I meant policemen. <laughs> and then I saw something that made me terrified. I saw a student running up the pedestrian mall next to the soccer fields, next to the place where our women play softball. I saw a student running up that sidewalk screaming, this is a protest, this is not a war. And behind him, marching up the pedestrian mall in formation, in army khaki uniforms, with helmets on their heads, and batons, and rifles, were soldiers, oh pardon me, policemen in formation. And by then, the students were crowded over where they hoped the regions would come to hear them speak their truth. And these outside forces went in a line directly into the student crowd. They didn't skirt the crowd. They didn't come quietly. They went into the crowd. And I know a student who was shoved. And I know a student who was hit with a baton. I know somebody who bent down to help a young woman who was knocked over by these forces. And when he bent down to help her, he was hit. Not once, not twice, not thrice, not four times or five times, six times with a baton for trying to help her. Who witnessed him? Who bore witness and said that that happened? And I saw my students running toward me screaming because they had started firing projectiles into the crowd. Who reported that? Did you see it in the news? Did you see somebody write a letter about it? It happened. I was there. I bore witness. I saw it. I saw a young man carried out of the crowd by his friends and loved ones and they laid him down on the ground and he was writhing in pain because he had been shot by projectiles. Three times. Three times. Three times. Three times. 
And because I'm sort of a motherly type, I ran over there. And I did whatever I could think of to do, which is like a mother. I put my head on his, my hand on his forehead like he had a fever or something. <laughs> and he was hyperventilating. I think he might have been scared, but I also know he was in pain. He was in pain. Our student was in pain. Who said anything about it? So he went there to speak his truth, and he got shot at. That was wrong. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. It was an overreaction at best. At worst, it was an attempt to silence our students yeah, yeah. when all they are trying to do is speak the truth of what's happening to them as they try to rise up to their best potential. As they come to my classes and I try to tell them, you have a right to have your voice be heard, and then they believe me and they go out and they try to have that happen and they're met with violence in the United States of America. And I just want to say that on that day, I felt proud of the students. I felt proud of standing there. Yeah. 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 I felt honored to witness them speak their truth. And I felt dishonored to see what their truth was met with. So, where do we go from here? I say, keep speaking your truth. Yeah. Let them know what's happening to you. Don't meet violence with violence. Sit down if you're met with violence. Sit down and keep your head down and say your truth. Thank you. Yeah. 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 We will have free speech and then we will visit these skirmish points that this violence took place at. And after that, we are headed for the police department, the UCPD, to file complaints about their violence. Yeah! Yeah! Woo! So join us for that. Our next speaker is going to take over now. Takeover sounds pretty serious. All right. Come on. Come on. I need your help. I need your help. I saw Tim out here. Where did Tim go? Where did Tim Aguilar go? Tim Aguilar, my check. And where's Andrea Gutierrez? Tim. Yeah. Come on, Andrea. Oh, that means I gotta get Goldberg's germs. I bet she's got a cold too. All right, I'm Susan Strait. I'm a professor in the creative writing department. And I've been teaching here for 24 years. But I have an, another little story to tell you. I grew up across the street. I mean really across the street, like on Massachusetts Avenue. Like, you guys know where Massachusetts Avenue is, right? Yeah, it's right there. And sadly enough, when I was nine years old, and some of my students have heard this story before, I climbed the bell tower from the outside. Don't do that. It's not a good idea. My brother dared me. I couldn't help it. I'm here today because of anyone who teaches here on this entire campus. I am probably the only native and the only person who could ever say to you, I climbed the bell tower from the outside when I was nine years old, which is pretty stupid. Again, and don't try this. Okay, it's not, it's not why I'm bringing it up. I love this place. I really, really do, otherwise I wouldn't be here. All of my students know how much I love them. But here's the deal. I brought you something else. I brought you these, okay? And I'm not gonna talk about January 19th because I wasn't here, I was over there in Chase Yamamoto's class. Here's what I wanna say to you. You're here because some lady in 1860 who was an abolitionist and three times divorced 
and a suffragette and wanted women to be able to vote, planted these oranges, these exact kind of oranges, in Riverside, and she watered them with water from her sink after she finished doing the dishes, okay? These come from Brazil. She was from Cincinnati. Her name was Eliza Tibbetts. This university was founded on the Citrus Experiment Station in the 50s. We do stuff here nobody else does. Nobody else does. We have entomologists, scientists, engineers. We have writers. Here's what I want to say to you today. When anyone says to you, oh, college, aren't you lucky? When that generation, which I'm really disappointed about, which is my generation, says, I don't want to pay for you to go to college. Oh, you guys are spoiled. Who needs to go to college? That is ridiculous. You make something here. And I brought my students around me to say, where did you come from? Um, well, I'm a transfer student in community college, um, from Sumnina Valley College. But my parents come from Mexico. I was actually born in Juarez, Mexico. And um, I migrated to California when I was four years old. All right. I just wanted you to know that because my mother only had a green card when she was pregnant with me. I am the first person in my family to go to college. I'm very proud of saying that. My parents didn't graduate from high school, and I was able to go to college, and I grew up across the street. That should never, ever, ever be taken away from you. It doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter, as Goldberry said, who we are. We are supposed to go to college because we want to be better humans. That's right. All right? We want to be better humans. And the second part of that is still this. I feel like here at UCR, we are the best of the best because we make things. And it drives me crazy when people say, oh, not everybody needs to go to college. Okay, that's fine. Then don't go to college or don't send your kids to college. But don't give me that. I'm tired of paying taxes to send other people's kids to college. Are you crazy? We want people to go to college. What is wrong with you? We make things here. I come here every day and I never miss class because I make something. I don't move money around from account to account. I don't do stuff on the computer that doesn't belong to me. I will tell you what I make. I make students, I make teachers, I make social workers, I make doctors, I make people. That's what I do. I never miss class. I always turn my stuff in on time. And when I go home at night, I have three kids. Two are in college, and one is a junior in high school. And you know what she said to me this morning? Because I said I was nervous about coming here. And she said, Mom, I'm applying to college next year. How are we going to do this? I have three kids who have this whole vision of making something too and making a difference. How can I not want you to speak your mind and you to be supported? And as Goldberry said, how can I not want you to have the classes that you need? And how can I not want you to feel as if we want you here? When I'm going home and telling my child, I want you to go to college, I want you to make a difference. I want you to always speak your mind. I do. I want you to write. I said this last spring. I want you to write to your legislators. Yes. This is not just about us. You know who's taking your money away. Come on. <laughs> who's taking your money away? It's people up in Sacramento, all right? It's the legislature. And there is money. I know this because we have all these meetings and I look at where the money goes. There is money for you. I pay taxes for you and I don't pay no 15%. I'm not like that right now. All right, I'm a single mom with three kids and somehow I pay way more taxes than some other people that I'm just saying. All right, not naming any names, just saying when I do my taxes, which will be this week, and my accountant, Mark Higgins, who went to Ramona High and I went to North High, we're always like, man, how come we suck at this? I don't know. I'm going to pay my 30%. Okay. Here's why I brought these. I brought these because 24 years ago, my first year of teaching, I had a student, and his name was George, and he wanted to be an engineer. And he took my English class, and I had to teach him how to write compositions. Your least favorite thing is to have to learn how to write compositions. I know that about you, okay? 24 years ago, I treated him well because he was my student. And he asked me for a letter of recommendation to get a job, and I wrote it for him. And for 24 years, his parents have brought me eight shopping bags of oranges every January. 
for 24 years. They leave them on my porch. They never leave me a note. They are still paying me back for writing one letter of recommendation for their son, who is now a teacher in a high school with four kids in his own. Okay? That is what it means to live here. That is what it means to go to school here. And that is what I want you to remember. All right? Is that we are supposed to hook you up, help you out, do things for you, do anything we can, and you are supposed to, in return, work hard, which you did to get here. How many of you have parents who did not go to college? There, is, there are very few places in the world where I can have that kind of response. That's why I love working here, all right? I wanna know how many of you plan to go into some kind of career where you will be helping or serving people. Honestly, because that's what I always see. Engineers, doctors, lawyers, yeah, but teachers, social workers, and yes, writers, okay? I am more than ever proud of you, every single time. I love my classes. I want you to write letters. I want you to continue to make yourself heard. I want you to post stuff on the web. I want you to succeed because I, I think we're gonna fail without you. As a state, as a mom, as a professor, but as a native of this place, we're gonna fail without you. So do not give up, okay? And I got some oranges here. <laughs> All right. I don't know who's talking next, but please, 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 do not stop going to class. Do not stop writing. And we do love you. I love you very much. <laughs> Okay, that was very uplifting. Next we have Farrah Godrich. And I would like to remind you all that we will be chalking. So if you would like some chalk, speak your mind. You do it right now. Yeah. You can chalk right now. Chalk it out. Here's Farrah. Thank you. So my name is Farah Godridge and I teach in the political science department here at UC Riverside. Woo! See a couple of my poli sci buddies out here. So I want to begin by invoking someone whose writings and whose thought I study and whose voice I think was very much in the background suddenly on what happened here on January 19th. I want to talk about Mahatma Gandhi. And the reason I want to talk about Gandhi is because Gandhi specifically talks about non-violence as a form of dissent. And he tells us how we can use non-violence to refuse to recognize the moral authority of an ex existing regime. <laughs> so the question I want to ask, and the question that I think we should all be asking here together, is what exactly is non-violent dissent? And how do we express it? And, moreover, what kinds of responses does it provoke from those whose authority is being challenged? And finally, how do we think critically and strategically about organizing nonviolent movements to be prepared for those kinds of responses? That's what I want to talk about. And I think turning to Gandhi for answers to these questions can be really helpful. And it's one way for us to think about what happened here on January 19th. So, when Gandhi talks about non-violent political action, he uses a word, he uses a Sanskrit word, satyagraha. And that word means standing firm in the truth. Holding firm to the truth. So Gandhi says, when you engage in non-violent action, what are you doing? You are standing firm in the truth and you are refusing to cooperate with untruth or injustice. That's what nonviolence is. So when you act nonviolent, you nonviolently, you highlight injustice, and you also express your refusal to cooperate with it, and you express your desire to change that regime of untruth. That is one of the things that I think was going on here on January 19th. The dissent that was being expressed here on this campus was a claim about the truth or justice of public education. 
and it was an attempt to actively oppose what was seen as an injustice of the existing system. Now here's the really interesting thing that Gandhi says about how you're actually supposed to express that dissent. He says, the non-violent resistor or protester must be a warrior. Gandhi says, we need willful disobedience, we need open defiance, and we need repeated acts of disruption and provocation that challenge the legitimacy and authority of any given regime. Observe non-violence, Gandhi says, and defy, disrupt, and make trouble in order to demonstrate the strength of your conviction. So another way of saying this is, troublemaking is the accompaniment to seeking the truth. You want to seek the truth, and you want to actively push for the truth, you have to make trouble. I'm not saying this, Gandhi did, okay? So, here's the other thing, folks, that Gandhi has to say about troublemaking. He says, we don't just disrupt things because we like disrupting stuff. We don't make trouble for the heck of it, I'm paraphrasing here. We make trouble, we defy, we disrupt, not only as a way to highlight the injustice that we are opposing, but also as a way to convince our opponent, to persuade with dialogue, to convince our adversary of the truth of our claims through our defiance. We're saying, this is how strongly we feel and we're going to try and persuade you of how important we think this is. So that's another thing that I think was going on here on January 19th. The attempt to persuade people of how strongly we felt, how strongly some of us held those convictions about public education. What kind of response did it provoke? Notice, the response to that moment of disruption was to declare it unlawful and to declare everyone present criminal for engaging in this act of disruption. So the entire justification for bringing in a highly militarized police force in full riot gear was somehow that the protesters were potentially dangerous. They were threatening. What this means is that when the authority of any system is challenged, its ability to justifiably criminalize nonviolent dissent depends on convincing people that disruption equals danger. No matter how many loud proclamations we make about peaceful protest, no matter how much you talk about truth or justice, if you shout loudly and disrupt the business of the system, you are a threat. And that's what justifies the militarization, the rubber bullets, the batons, and all of that. So, what does this mean? I think it means that we have to think carefully and strategically about ways to make trouble, to disrupt, to defy and express opposition while pushing back against being criminalized. It means that we need to disrupt the narrative. We need to rewrite the story that says that angry, disruptive troublemakers are dangerous, potentially criminal individuals. We need to figure out how to make our troublemaking disciplined and organized and deliberate rather than just chaotic and loud and angry. And when we do so, we can take back the identity of the non-violent dissenter as a warrior who is motivated by truth and justice, and as someone whose disruption and defiance is an expression of that moral commitment. And that is what I encourage all of you to keep doing. Thank you. All right, I would like to encourage all of you to get some chalk and reclaim this space as yours because that is what this space is. It belongs to the students. Um, and our next speaker is Pat Morton. So give her a warm welcome. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, this is going to be short because I've literally lost my voice. <laughs> but you all have not lost your voices. And what I want to talk about is, um, I'm Pat Morton, I'm the chair of the art history department, I'm chair of the Riverside Faculty Association. I can't, I lost my voice. Closer, closer, does that help? Okay, great. Um, so, um, I'm a member of the Free UCR Alliance also, and what I want to talk about is the, um, 
why I became an activist, uh, why I got involved. And I, I would say that I got involved originally because I was really angry and furious even about the, the cuts, the budget cuts, the furloughs, the tuition increases, all of the things that are happening which are quantifiable, um, but that um, have happened over the last two and a half years. And I sort of feel like my, my laryngitis today, maybe it's a metaphor for having I feel like I'm shouting all the time against the administration, against what's happening. For two and a half years I've been shouting, I'm kind of paying for it now. Uh, but, um, so I would say that there was a lot of anger that motivated me originally, and I was fed up with the lies, I was fed up with the duplicitous spin of, uh, oh, this is all about state budget cuts, this is not about the real agenda, which is privatization. And that privatization agenda existed before we got here, before we started agitating, and it's just going on. It, it pre-existed all of this. But the state budget cuts have been an excellent excuse, which have made a, the, allowed the administration then to, um, to spin this. And I'm sick of seeing UC being destroyed. It makes me so angry. But that said, I mean, I think righteous anger is important, and I think we need to speak out of course, that we may be uh, sick of shouting. Um, we need to speak out, and we need to express ourselves, but I think that that place of anger is actually not so, it's not so motivating in the end. Um, and I find, I get tired, I get sh tired of shouting, uh, I get tired of fighting, and I find what motivates me is you all. I find, I go to a meeting, and I'm just thinking, oh my God, I cannot possibly do another meeting, I can't one more event, another rally, whatever. But I really do get inspiration from working in coalition and working with a broad group, based group of people here on campus, staff, students, faculty, whoever is, is involved and wants to be a part of this. And that is in, immeasurable. It's, it is priceless, you know, as they say in the commercial. It means much more than I can tell you because it's transformed UCR for me. Yeah, from a really alienated and alienating place to a place which has a core, which has this fighting spirit. And I say, keep your voices, keep shouting, keep fighting, and don't stop. I managed to get inside of, of how they had them and try to film it. 
as soon as I started saying shame, 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 and grab my phone and try to take pictures, all of a sudden, Sheriff from the back grabbed me and dragged me all the way inside the hub and arrested me. They used force. I had a couple of bruises on my arms, but it's okay. But while they had me... It's not okay. It, it's not okay. Yes, it's not okay. It's, it, thank you. It's not okay at all. But once I was in there, I demanded to know why I was arrested. They put the handcuffs and everything. I demanded to know, am I really arrested? I couldn't believe it at that at that time. I could not believe it. They wouldn't answer my questions. I was there. Um, um, I got arrested like around three. They didn't. They wouldn't answer any questions. The protester that that I saw that they arrested went in at the same time. And I told him, hey, calm down. I saw everything, you know, just calm down, calm down. He was, he was furious because of what had happened, of the way they treated him. They put us in the hub. We were there for a while. Um, the intimidation that they, the, the, the harassment. There was a time where one of the officers said, have you, have you guys, um, did you guys eat already? And we were like, no, we have not. Well, too bad. It's time for me to eat. And he got one of his lunch and he, right in front of us, we were there at the table, right in front of us, he started eating. And it was just like, and, and the protester, the, the guy next to me, he was like, can you please like move, sit somewhere else? Because we don't, I don't really want to see you eat. And he was like, well, too bad, turn around. And the, it was just, the, the things he said, there's a lot of things he said. Uh, we, would, we, would demand why, we would demand to know why we were being arrested and they would just tell us, well, you were out there, you know what you did, um, I don't know, you guys are going crazy. There was a time where we were, we were in there and the cops took a break in there. Sorry, I'm, I'm ripped here. They took the break. I'm, I'm guessing they changed shifts or something. And they went inside the same room they had us in. And the intimidation that was that I felt, I felt like, like, like I was there. They were eating me with their eyes. They were sitting down. They were... They were sitting down and they were mimicking us. I could hear them. They were saying, oh yeah, look at them out there. And then they would come in and they'll be like, oh man, we only have two? Oh man, because it was only two, two of us at that time. We only have two, men. And they'll just look around. Like if, like, like if it was a game, it was all a game for them. Um, it's just horrible. I got released later on that day. But I'm here to say that I got arrested for trying to, 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 to film, to try to, Tell the people, tell them, you know, I was saying shame, shame, shame. They wouldn't even, it was just horrible, horrible. The, the experience I have, the UCPD, I encourage everyone to file their complaints. Um, it's just, it was just horrible. And I'm here to say power to the people. We're, we're still sad. And um, yeah. Yeah! Thank you so much for your personal account. I really feel that everybody needs to hear more stories like this. Um, okay, so right now we are going to open stacks so that you can get on to free speech. Um, the symbol to get on stack is two fingers up in the air, and this lovely lady in the orange pants, Seraphin, is going to take stack, and that is how we are going to um, do this. If you have a lot to say, that's great, but there are many people that have a lot to say, so just be conscious of that. Also, if you have any demands, any grievances, any response that you want to be heard, either chalk it out, put it on the banner, just let people know. We're also going to have a march after this to the skirmish point, and then over to the police station where you can file complaints against UCPD for their presence on our campus. Okay, who do we have first on stack? Uh, we have a... Hello, hello, we have Micah. Micah, first on stack. Yeah. What color do you like better? Like black. Woo! 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 Hey. <laughs> um, my name is Micah. I'm, an, I'm actually a student at RCC right now. And I've spent more time on this campus over the last few months. Uh, and not even being a student here yet, I feel really uh, connected with this campus and some of the professors and a lot of the students already. Um, when I transition here, uh, I don't think I'm going to have a hard time um, fitting in and uh, getting into this thing. But um, 
it's also it brings up the whole point of being here and um, <clears throat> You know, there's a part of me, and some of the professors spoke to this before they, before we um, did this, and they were talking about how it's a uh, right and it's our duty to get educated, and um, it shouldn't, we shouldn't feel guilty for that. And I say that because there's a part of me, based on what's going on with the economy right now, and a lot of the comments you hear, uh, people saying things such as like um, that we're lazy and that we deserve, that we're entitled, and all this stuff. Um, there's a part of me that has this like guilt and shame that I, I I go to school, you know, like I'm not supposed to do this or something. Like I should just get this job. And uh, thank you for sharing what you guys shared because I was like almost in tears sitting there listening to this, realizing that this is okay to be here. Um, I'm 37. I should technically uh, be already like married. I have I'm married. I should have like kids and I should have a house and all these things by the standard of the American dream and how that's supposed to work. Um, I'm a 37 year old returning student. I've had a life that's been like all over the place. I've had ups and downs and whatever, and I'm here now doing uh, what I want to do with my life, and um, I feel like it's for the greater good. And uh, I, I'm really um, disappointed in the fact that, uh, like, my grandparents were the generation that um, had to hunker down because of the depression and all that to build up a system that we could live in, and then the group after that is coming along and tearing it all apart. And, uh, and creating a system that's uh, not where, there, where there's nothing left but a mess for us in the future system to go um, generations to go into. So I'm putting my attention towards those that are my age and younger and, uh, and, uh, and looking there for the redemption and the health and the healing of this planet because I'm not, I can't look above anymore. Uh, it's not happening. Um, the people above have done nothing but take and uh, dismantle. And uh, you know, um, right now at RCC, one of the things that's going on with students that are our Getsy students, uh, the ones that when you do your Getsy transfer to get into UC or to uh, CSU, um, this semester, anybody who has over 30 units is being dropped from financial aid. And you can't go to your counselor and appeal to have that changed on your student education plan. So what they're doing is saying we can't change it, sorry, uh, you have to do the rest of your uh, 15, 30 units uh, without financial aid. And uh, this is happening at RCC. I'm sure it's happening at all the community colleges. This is uh, uh, as of this month. And so, I mean, it's affecting everybody on all levels, you know. I rely on, uh, on student uh, education. I rely on student um, aid to uh, go to school. I go to school. I, I work on, uh, at the Disability Student Services on campus. Um, I'm involved in two clubs. I'm involved in all kinds of extracurricular activities, and I'm a full-time student, I'm an honor student, and I'm a straight-A student, and I want to come here, and I want to come here, and I want to get my education, and I don't want to pay $20,000 to do that. I, can't, I went through several private institutions before coming here, University of Phoenix, all those bullcrap uh, institutions, and, uh, and I already racked up $35,000 in debt. So I don't plan on adding to that, you know, and so um, I, I'm here to fight until it, it, it needs to, um, until it changes, so thank you. Thank you, Micah. All right, um, just a reminder, there are lots of speakers, and if you guys could keep it to a minute, that'd be great, so that we can hear everybody's voice and things like that. <laughs> also, if you don't get on deck, but you still have lots to say, we have a banner, we have chalk, you need to chalk it out, people, just chalk it out. <laughs> At the police station. And then we are also going to be chalking at the police station because we need to reclaim spaces with chalk. I love that idea. Okay. Okay, next we have, uh, next we have Lulu. 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 Okay, hi, my name is Lulu. I am a second year honor student here at UC Riverside. And I just want to tell my personal story about what happened on the 19th. So, okay, number one, I am just really, I'm really flabbergasted because if they're privatizing our education and they're just, they keep doubling it and they keep doubling it, they don't expect us to speak out and they criminalize us for speaking out, that's just ridiculous. Yeah, pretty much. So, okay, so basically a uh, personal story about um, what happened over there by the hub. I can never go to the hub again without without feeling sad. I have two scars. I have an internal scar and that shit will never go away because, okay, um, okay, what happened? 
it's it's really it's really it's really a messy situation, you know, when you're when you're in that type of when you're in that type of brutality and everything, like you don't really know what's going on. So basically, you have these stupid UCPD who's lined up against the students that they're supposed to protect. We're just standing there with those book blocks, which are made out of wood, just trying to build a barrier between their asses and the students because they're not safe. And so, okay. And then we're just standing there. We've been standing there for an hour, and these dumbasses decide to take out their batons and start hitting us. So, okay, I had, I was holding a book block, and that's made out of wood. If you could look at it, they had baton holes in them. Like, that's ridiculous. And then after, they start, they, I was just yelling, I was just agitating, I was pissed. So, um, after they hit me, or after they hit my book block, they started hitting me. And they were going to arrest me, and I didn't know what was happening because I was just being beat. And then two of my friends, luckily, dragged me back. But both of them got shot! Both of them! They got shot with titanium pepper ball projectiles in their legs. And these assholes specifically target your shins, so you fall the fuck down and you can't defend your fellow comrades or your students. So, okay. So after that, I got up. I didn't know what happened. I see my my shirt is pulled off. That is ridiculous. But Officer Ruiz, R-U-I-Z, pulled my shirt off, beat my mouth, hit my legs and my arms. I woke up the next day with bruises. I couldn't go to class. I couldn't go to class on Thursday because I was pissed that my education tuition is increasing. Like, I, I can go to class right now. I'm missing work. I'm missing class. This is bullshit. We don't have to do this. But basically, that the day after, I received an email from my former sociology professor saying, Hi, I saw you in the front lines on, um, on Thursday, and I just wanted to thank you for defending public education. Now that's a pretty big deal. She's a sociology professor here at UC Riverside. That same day, we all received a letter from the chancellor saying how he was disappointed in the students and how the stupid ass UCPD had to protect themselves against <laughs> us. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We are nonviolent. We have no weapons but our voices and that is being taken away as well. They have batons. They have shit. They don't even have to. They, they, isn't there like a penal code that says UCPD can't have any weapons that like shoot projectiles at students? Really? So, okay, I cannot... They're supposed to protect us. I can no longer see a UCPD officer and feel safe. I am the criminal, apparently. And that's bullshit. Yeah! Woo! Woo! All right, who do we have next on stack? All right, we have, uh, we have Lindsay. Lindsay! Lindsay. Oh, yeah. Come on now! Also, after this free speech, we will be marching to the skirmish points. We will be reclaiming those spaces with chalk. If you have any grievances, if you have any demands, if you have an experience that needs to be told, just chalk it out, man. Chalk it out. Okay, here's Lindsay. Also, you'll be able to, we'll, we'll have a, another sort of rally in front of the police station where you can tell your story. We'll, we'll open up the mic again there. Um, after we march. I am Lindsay and I'm a UC Berkeley student. I came here on the 19th to to participate in the in the UC Regents public um, comment section and participate in the democratic process of that and we were clearly not being listened to and when I came outside of that meeting I was faced with extreme brutality against my fellow students and members of the community. And um, then I personally was specifically targeted by one UCPD officer, Officer Stephen Own. He sexually harassed myself and a female friend. He, he while brandishing a, a billy club and in full riot gear, he started making kissy sounds at us, blowing kisses, Whoa. winking, Whoa. making gestures. And we requested to get his badge number and to uh, speak with a, a superior officer, and we were ignored. They stood there and they moved him back in line and ignored us. And this is in the same spot 
where there had been people were getting shot and beaten earlier in that day in that very same place he's sexually harassing students and I also no longer can feel safe on UCR campus on any UC campus because he's a UCLA PD and they they outsource them anywhere no one no, so people like Stephen Own should not have a badge and a gun and be on any on any UC campus whatsoever. So I'm going to go file a complaint at the police station today, and I want anyone else who has any similar story to to join me and um, and tell your story. Even if they don't join you. <laughs> Even if you don't join me, tell your story still. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to be giving a 10 minute warning to close stack, so um, we're going to have 10 minutes and then we're going to start the march. How do you guys feel about that? Awesome. Woo, okay. Also, reminder chalk it out, people. Just chalk it out. Chalk it out. Chalk it out. Chalk it out. Chalk we have this gentleman right here, whose name I neglected to get. This gentleman right here! Come on down. Gentlemen! Yeah, gentlemen! Hello, everyone. Uh, I feel a little bit nervous, so that with uh, We're with you, it's so awesome! Right up Thank on the you! Mouth. Right up on the okay, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah! Yeah! Okay, so just uh, a few points. Um, one with regards to, you know, the political policing that goes on. It's important to realize that, you know, this is, it, it's multi-layered. It's not just local. You know, it goes on at the federal level, too. I don't know how many of you out there are or know individuals who have been targeted by the state, which is basically, you know, just being um, subject to repeated harassment, flyovers, um, street light changes, things like that. Basically, what I refer to as reminders that you're on this watch list, and it's basically psychological terrorism being carried out by the state. So. It's a, but this is political policing as well, and so it's just, I think it's important to, like, have a, a view of, of the bigger picture of what's going on. By show of hands, uh, just to take kind of an informal survey, does anybody know who's being subject to that kind of harassment at this point? No, very, okay, so that suggests, if that's a random sample of society, that suggests it's not very widespread. But it does go on, and often, I know individuals very close to me who are being subject to this kind of treatment, and, uh, for nothing more than political dissent, et cetera. The same kinds of things that students are talking about being targeted for here at a more local level. Another point I wanted to make with regards to activism and the effectiveness of having progressive change, I think that you know movements like this are important um, in themselves, particularly just to uh, increase awareness and for the symbolic value. There's a lot to be said for that, so don't let anybody tell you that you know what you're doing out here is worthless. Um, but in addition to that, I, I also think that there's a lot to be said for getting into, or occupying, you might say, um, positions in which decisions have to be made within the bureaucracy, within the government, things like that. Um, you feel that you have a lot more traction, you'll find, when you get into positions like that, and you can, you know, make strong arguments against spending money here or there. Um, so that's another point. Um, <laughs> I guess that's it for now. I feel like I had a list of things that I wanted to highlight, but it's it escaped me for the time being. Um, okay. It's good for now. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much for sharing your story. Should have said your name. Political Science Department. Right yeah. yeah. The Political Science Department. Yeah, we're getting representation. Yeah. Woo. I'm also from the Poly Science Department. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's next on staff? Okay, James James. Come on down! Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. My check! My check! Really quick, I'd like to go over a few things! Really quick, I'd like to go over a few things! In my observations of the day's events... In my observations of the day's events... On January 19th... On January 19th... Students were fairly peaceful! Students were fairly peaceful! Students were fairly peaceful. They were very conscious of people who were being aggressive! They were very conscious of people who were being aggressive! Organizers were taking charge to make sure they weren't being aggressive! Organizers were taking charge to make sure they weren't being aggressive! We were being accountable! We were being accountable! To ourselves! To ourselves! And we were 
completely capable. And we're completely capable of functioning. Of functioning. Non-violently. Non-violently. Ethically. Ethically. And productively. And productively. Without state coercive powers. Without state coercive powers. I think that's all I really have to say. I think that's all I really have to say. Woo! Okay, so just a reminder, in five minutes we're going to start the march. Yeah! And if anybody that would like to file a complaint against the UCP, you should follow us. Our support! Our support! Our support. We love support. You don't have to file one. We encourage you to. Or if you're against it, follow us anyway. And next up step, next up step we have David C. David C., where are you? Yeah, David. You're already down there. Hey y'all, um, there's a famous quote by Dr. Martin Luther King, it goes, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And the reason why I say this is because I'm speaking as a person of color, I come from backgrounds where just for being brown, looking like a peaceful human being, walking to school with a backpack, I got cops pulling me over, asking, are you on parole? Oh no, then you must be on probation, you know? And I also want to speak to the fact that you know, when we come to this institution, whether you're a freshman or you're a transfer student, you go to that little thing called the Highland Orientation. And I always remember, this was the main lesson I got from Highland Orientation. If you're a student, do not walk past university in Chicago. Keep away from those. Those are dirty areas. They're ghetto, you know? And you know what I did? I decided to take a walk to those areas. Get to know, because guess what? This is their community too, it's not just ours. We shouldn't be shielding ourselves from these communities. And you know what I found out? I happen to meet gangbangers, ex-gangbangers that right now are trying to work on establishing a peace treaty within their communities and working on mobilizing to get the communities to bring about real change. There's a gangbanger I know by the name of Jay, former gangbanger. He owns a barbershop out here. He tells me stories. Recently, over the winter break, a bunch of cops just went in and raided a bunch of families. It didn't matter to them if you were a gangbanger or not. If you were black, you were a gangbanger. If you were brown, you were automatically a gangbanger. And the reason why I speak to this is because as students, we should not be self-centered. And when we say we stand in solidarity, we should really stand in solidarity and keep it out of our mind that for every student that gets assaulted with a police baton, for every student that gets shot at, there's a brown kid out there that's probably going through this every day. There's a black kid out there that's going through this every day. So when we're out here marching, we're marching with them too. Thank you. All right, we have about two minutes left for stack for free speech. Okay, the next person we have is Andrea. Woo! Andrea, come and join us. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I am uh, a graduate student in the creative writing department, and I actually just wanted to read a letter to you that um, 26 of us students faculty and alumni from the Creative Writing and Writing and Performing Arts program here um, signed um, in response to the events of January 19th and we've hand delivered it and emailed it to the Chancellor last Friday. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. We have not yet re received a response but I know he's going to be courteous enough to, courteous enough to give one to us. Um, but here we go. Dear Chancellor White, as graduate students, teaching assistants, alumni, and faculty from the MFA program for creative writing and writing for the performing arts at UC Riverside, it's a mouthful, uh, we are deeply disappointed by the actions taken by the university last Thursday, January 19th. We participated in the campus-wide action comprised of UC students, faculty, and staff outside of the hub while the UC regions continued their meeting in privacy. This day-long action is indeed an expression of outrage over rising tuition and depreciating quality of education. It was also a celebration of community and solidarity. We witnessed our students chanting or engaging in discussions about the grim future of UC Riverside. For many of them, this was their first political protest. One of our students, a mother of two, brought her three-year-old daughter. The student lamented forgetting to dress her daughter in her Highlander shirt. She wanted her daughter to bear witness to the fight for her future education. We witnessed UCR students and community members dressed in black, bearing colorful life-size banners, right here, um, depicting the book covers of liberatory texts. These books envision quality and freedom and question privilege and cultural hegemony, such as Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, Bell Hooks's Fem 
feminism is for everyone, and Paolo Freire's Pedagogy for the Oppressed, which has been banned in Arizona, uh, among others. The book block remained at the front of the line, protecting protesters as they faced a staggering number of riot police at the hub exit. We couldn't help but recognize the clear metaphor in all of this. Despite what your Friday letter states, and I know y'all have read the Friday letter by this point, there were more than just a few individuals at this action. We witnessed hundreds of students, staff, and faculty who were merely who merely wanted to engage in an open discussion with the UC Regents. As police helicopters circled above us, we witnessed your, our students, your students, pushed, shoved, and humiliated by riot police because of this desire to converse and be heard by the Regents. We witnessed members of our community shot by police officers with paint pellet guns. One young man was knocked to the ground by the shock and force of these pellets. We witnessed sheer violence by your co-workers, the police, who instead of marching around the students to take their positions, marched directly through the crowd as if they wanted to incite the kind of riot they were brought in to quell. Yeah. However, in your Friday letter, you failed to acknowledge the many injuries that UCPD and several outside law enforcement agencies inflicted upon your students, injuries that were also ignored by many major news outlets who I'm sure are here today. We believe that you see our students deserve an explanation and an apology. The few individuals who peacefully the few individuals, excuse me, scare quotes, who peacefully dis disrupted the UC Regents meeting re represent more than a handful of marginal opinions, and they're not just fucking outsiders either. Give your students more credit. These few individuals exercise an essential act of civil disobedience and represent many of us in the UC Riverside and UC community who are fed up with business as usual. We urge you to provide opportunities for students to engage in dialogue such as a public forum or town hall about last Thursday's events and the implications behind police presence at the, as the university's response to student, student assembly and protest. We urge you to take responsibility for putting your student safety on the line. We urge you to ensure their safety and right to express their discontent with the UC system by supporting future student action. Sincerely, the undersigned. Yeah. Sorry, probably a little bit over time. One last thing, UC artists is having a meeting. This is a group, a collective of artists on campus, writers, dancers, musicians, whoever you want to call, however you want to call yourself an artist, having a meeting at 5 p.m. tonight, 4120 INTS. You can ask me afterwards if you want more. Free pizza! Free pizza! Free pizza. Yeah. All right, everybody. Um, we will continue free speech at the police station, so if you are on stack, don't worry, you will be heard. Right. We are going to start moving towards the skirmish point, so...